advertising is sort of the last thing that people want in their lives. They really want, you know, human connections or they want content or they want entertainment. You know, the job is made easier when it's coming from something I know and trust. Welcome to the Backcountry Marketing Podcast. My name is Cole Heilborn. Today, I'm sitting down with Andrew Katz. He is the CMO at Athletic Brewing. Andrew, how are you? I am doing fantastic. Above average, even. Above average? That must mean that you have an athletic in your hands currently. Um, I actually have, uh, I'm not going to lie, I have an athletic water bottle, so I'm I'm hydrating today. (laughs) I love it. So before we were chatting, you mentioned that this is your first podcast or one of your first few podcasts that you've done? One of the first few, yes. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'm super excited to have you on the show. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And I know it's been a little bit of a, a little bit of a calendar schedule to try to make this episode happen. But here we are. And let's let's dive in. Andrew, I'd love if you could introduce yourself, just give us a little bit of the breakdown of your role with athletic and also give a little background on athletic for folks who might not be familiar. Absolutely. So um, as you said, I'm the chief marketing officer at Athletic Brewing Company. I joined the company a little over a year ago. Um, in this role, um, I get to do a little bit of everything and anything. Um, we're still very much a startup, which is a lot of the appeal for me as a, as a marketer. Um, so, you know, everything from earned media to own media to uh, packaging to PR, social media, um, you know, I I have uh, my hands in all of that. Uh, my team is both domestic and international. So we have uh, a team of almost 18 marketers, which is pretty amazing, you know, in a company of about 200 people. I'd say the most important thing is, you know, we happen to have the best product in the non-alcoholic beverage space, um, especially when it comes to beer. Did non-alcoholic beer exist before Athletic? Because I feel like it's only been since Athletic has been around that it's become a thing. I think it's become cool because of Athletic that uh, it's something that people are actually really excited to drink because it is um, an incredible experience. It's a really cool brand. It's a very modern take on uh, the category prior to athletic. Um, Odul's really sort of uh, pioneered the category, but it had so much negative baggage associated with it. It was really designed for people who couldn't drink alcohol. So primarily, you know, alcoholics came in a dusty green bottle. Uh, It's owned by ABI. So Anheuser-Busch owns it. And I don't, you know, I don't think it was ever really a priority for them, but they made it available because in part, I think they had to, from a PR standpoint, they needed, you know, some kind of alternative uh, to full alcohol. Um, But the category really had seen no meaningful innovation in 30 plus years. And when Bill, you know, first had the idea uh, in his mind, you know, he was very much, you know, uh, a Wall Street guy, a high performance guy um, who really cared a lot about his health, but first and foremost, that he really wanted to be at the top of his game and, you know, spent a lot of evenings out with clients and, you know, he didn't really necessarily want to drink because he knew the next morning he was going to get up and he wanted to, you know, get his fitness done. And, and so he, you know, I think he really searched to solve his own personal problem, which was, I really love beer. So you, you, the company was founded fairly recently. Um, I read a stat somewhere that I think sums up some of the growth that you have been having in the last few years. And this is from Inc. Magazine. You were rated as one of the 26 fastest growing private companies in America. I'm, I'm assuming that's accurate. Yes. Yes, it's, uh, it is 100% accurate. We were the 26 fastest growing private company in America last year. That's right. Wow. That's amazing. How does that feel? Um, It feels exciting. Um, It feels that there's a lot of wind at our back, but the reality is, you know, as as you and I were discussing sort of before uh, jumping into this part of the conversation, we're just scratching the surface. Um, You know, by way of uh, the numbers, you know, the entire non-alcoholic beer segment 
is less than a, a total share point of all beer. So it's, it's less than a billion dollars in a 110 billion uh, category. So there, there's a long way to go to making this a more mainstream, uh, you know, experience. And I think just education really is at the core of a lot of our marketing, you know, educating people on why would I want a non-alcoholic beer, you know, and giving them a lot of reasons to overcome their, their barriers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to get into that in a moment, but let's rewind briefly. Could you give us a little bit of your story of your background. I know you've been in the beverage industry for a long time. You've worked on a bunch of notable campaigns and brands. Could you kind of lay that out for us? I was uh, fortunate enough to have done my um, summer internship between my first and second year of business school at Pepsi, working in our North American beverage division and um, ended up getting a full-time offer and spent the next decade working across all of our major uh, beverages while I was at Pepsi. So everything from Mountain Dew and Pepsi to I had uh, an opportunity to work in our innovation team and and brought new products to market. Um, And honestly, you know, it was just one of the most formative experiences of my professional life. The people I worked with who have gone on to do incredible things in their careers you know, we were all there together and there was just the, the, the culture of learning and experimentation, even for a big company and a big brand, um, you know, being, being a number two uh, in, a, in a category gives you a lot of permission, right? You have everything to gain and nothing to lose. And so I loved um, always sort of having that underdog mentality and, um, you know, to use another sports analogy, it's like, you know, uh, we, it was like we were hitting the field every single day and going up against one of the best competitors in the world, again, you know, at Coke. And, and you learn a lot uh, from your peers and you learn a lot because you had a you know, ton of permission to try new things. Um, and I've taken that lesson with me, you know, everywhere I've gone. Um, I left Pepsi to join American Express where I had you know, a very different sort of professional experience, financial services, but, you know, an incredible brand where they, um, you know, really believe in the power of marketing. And um, I got to work on our core brand, the, the blue box is, is kind of the core brand, but then also worked with the business units and launched a bunch of different products, one with Walmart um, and one which was a new uh, type of rewards card. But again, I think being around a lot of very smart, very savvy marketers and all the while that I was there, the landscape, especially the media landscape, was evolving very rapidly. Social was becoming much more uh, found, like much more of a, a, a marketing channel. And then just, you know, kind of the advent of Facebook and Instagram. And a lot of that was happening while I was there and just navigating all of those different platforms was you know, an exciting thing to do as a way of, you know, how do I connect to my, uh, you know, user in a profoundly different way than I've been able to in the past. And so that was, that was great. And then from there, I, um, I got back into beverages and I, I, um, you know, went to work for Heineken and I got to work on probably one of the most iconic campaigns in the beer category, the most interesting man in the world. Um, but, you know, I had the unenviable role of sending him off into space, outer space. So, okay. so if, if, if you, if, if you're a listener and you love the most interesting man in the world, don't hate me. It was, it was purely a business <laughs> decision. Can you, can you elaborate on uh, how that decision came to be? Because I think that, that is, as you said, that's gotta be one of the most recognizable beverage campaigns ever created. For sure. It's amazing. Um, you no, know, it's it was it was incredible and it was just, you know, built on a, a great insight, which is how it came to life. And then uh Havas, who was the agency who created the campaign, um, you know, just did an, a remarkable job of of bringing that to life. And you know, I think as with almost any idea or advertising campaign, after a certain period of time, you you, you know, your cohort of people who discover the brand and you know, love the brand because of that campaign, well, they start to 
you know, they start to get older and as much as they embrace the brand, you know, in any beverage, the way you scale is household penetration. So the more buyers that are buying you, the bigger the brand gets. And over time, that campaign just proved to be less and less and less effective, you know, against a younger generation where everything they did was interesting. And if you don't believe it, just look at their Twitter feed or their Instagram feed or their TikTok because, you know, it wasn't you were needing to wait for an advertising campaign to see interesting things. The whole world became interesting because the whole world had a camera in their hand 24-7. And so it was difficult to then compete with reality. And so the decision was made that, you know, it was time to refresh the brand. And as challenging as that was going to be, and it was probably one of the biggest marketing challenges I've ever had in my career, it was the right thing to do. You mentioned that there was an insight that the whole campaign was founded upon. Uh, do, you, what, do you recall what that insight was? I'm curious. So was, again, this is before my time, but I, I met the account planner from the agency who kind of delivered the strategy that the creative was built on. You know, she was, she was hanging out with her husband and a, and a friend. And, you know, they, I think they were talking about, you know, this kind of assignment she had. And, um, you know, the idea, and she was making fun of him because she's like, well, you're the laziest man in the world, you know? And, uh, and he said, well, that's the campaign. And she's like, what do you mean that's the campaign? Well, he's, he's like, well, what if you flip that? And it's like, you know, what if I were the most interesting man in the world? You know, what would I drink? And, and the, but I think the brilliance of the campaign and, and so that was a great insight, right? Like that being interesting is, is still, is, is social currency, right? Especially if you're at a bar or a nightclub, like having something interesting to say, that you, you know, think broadly, it, it's a good, it's a good asset, you know, to have. Um, but the other thing that was so unique about the campaign was that it was, it was like, a very, even though it was kind of like this fantasy, there was some, there was a real honesty to it because the most interesting man in the world told you he doesn't always drink beer. Like what beer campaign was ever honest about that, right? In a beer world, all any, anyone ever drinks is beer. But we know that's not the real world. So he was he came clean and says, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis, right? And so a man of very discerning taste who doesn't really drink much beer, this is his only thing that he drinks. So I thought <clears throat> inheriting all of that was uh, you know, an incredible opportunity, but also the biggest challenge I ever had because how do you top that? <laughs> so this is a very random fact, but back in high school, I used to make a bunch of like YouTube short videos with my friends and we were obsessed with that catchphrase. And so we, we worked really hard to come up with our own YouTube video that could incorporate the most interesting man in the world's like, you know, his signature line. And I remember just spending a day like filming this YouTube video in my friend's neighborhood and like the last line of this little video was was that line. Uh, I don't I don't drink much, but when I do, I choose Dos Equis. And it, we thought it was the funniest thing in the world, and it was incredibly dumb. But I it, it it's so interesting. Like a single line can, like you know, me as a high schooler picked up on that. I never drank beer before, but like for some reason that that just stuck with us. It, yeah, because yeah. because it, it you know I think as with most compelling you know advertising. Having a point of view is really important, right? It's very easy to just kind of say nothing for 30 seconds. And in fact, at Pepsi, it was funny. It's like uh, we, had, we had a global head of advertising internally who his famous line was, if you have nothing, if you have nothing to say, just sing it. <laughs> which, which was like the basis for a lot of the best Pepsi commercials were just like Britney Spears or Rihanna or you know, somebody just singing and, and dancing around with a Pepsi. Cause like, it's very difficult to tell you something new about a brand that's so ubiquitous, hmm. right? So if you have nothing to yeah. say, just sing it, which I've always loved. Yeah, interesting. So, all right. So after Dos Equis, after you uh, put the most interesting man in the world out to space, <laughs> where did you move from there? So I, I also have sort of this uh, passion project you know, that I, I've been doing for the last six years, which is I teach indoor cycling uh, at Equinox. So I, I'm an indoor cycling instructor. I love fitness. 
And, um, you know, as someone who was in that world also, you know, I, I had this nagging problem of my own, which was, you know, the, the time and energy and effort it takes to prepare for classes is, is not insignificant. And for the most part, fitness instructors don't get paid for that time, right? Prep time is your time. So the more time you put in, the better the experience is for, you know, your, uh, you know, your users and, and the less time you put in, it becomes obvious that you put no time in and people don't come back. So I, um, I just thought that there was this huge opportunity to fill that gap of like, it's basically workflows and how do you create a tool for our fitness instructors to create and teach better classes. So I decided that I was going to go scratch this entrepreneurial itch. I left corporate America and I started my own fitness technology startup company called Instructor. It was really focused on the creative class of fitness and it's, it's, you know, very big. And, um, you know, the goal was to create an instructor app on the app store, which we did. So we launched a product. We had thousands of users and thousands more um, in our database. And then COVID happened and all the gyms shut down and uh, raising money was um, very challenging because this was ostensibly a tool for instructors. So we pivoted and created an online uh, two way uh, interactive tool, kind of like Riverside, the program we're on, but designed specifically for fitness instructors to schedule and monetize and uh, recruit new users. We, we, you know, struggled to raise money. And so I, you know, got a call from Athletic. In the meantime, we've got this opportunity. Are you interested? And it just seemed like it was a very good moment to kind of acknowledge this incredible entrepreneurial journey and experience, but it was also a perfect, like it, this was a, an impossible job to say no to. So jump ship to athletic, you bringing all this experience with you from the beverage industry. How is athletic different from the accounts and campaigns that you worked on previously? What were you brought in? Like when, when you got hired, what was your goal when you sat down with Bill for the first time? What did you guys talk about? I think, you know, it's the thing that was super appealing to me from the outset and, and it still is today. Um, a founder led company is just a fundamentally different experience from working for a corporation. So Bill and John, you know, it's their business, it's their company, it's their life. They've poured everything into it. So having that um, as our kind of foundation is, is an incredible thing. Right. And that, a nameless, faceless corporation is just that, a nameless, faceless corporation. So that was really important to me. Um, having just been a founder myself, I could really relate. And they would gotten so much further you know, than I ever had. So I have mad respect for them for what it took to get to where they are right now. So that was number one. Number two, the foundation of the company is you know, very much um, mission-led. And it's really about, yes, we have an incredible product, but at the end of the day, our, our mission is much bigger to really encourage people to lead happier, healthier lives for themselves and their communities. And, you know, in addition to being a B Corp and in addition to granting $2 million worth of our own profits to trails across throughout the world, so more people have more access to the outdoors, um, you know, like those things were so important and so compelling for me where I was on my own personal and professional journey that like that, those two things were just profoundly different than anything I'd ever uh, experienced in my professional life. And so the reason, you know, they were ready for a chief marketing officer is because, you know, they were getting to the point operationally where, you know, we just completed a, a state of the art brewery in Milford, Connecticut. So we have the capacity of 450,000 uh, barrels of beer can get produced in that one facility. And then we still have another couple hundred thousand on the West coast in our brewery in San Diego. So it was a combination of scale. We also brought in a chief sales officer, Alex Berger, who I used to work with at Heineken. So he joined at 
soon after I did. So now we're available in all 50 states. We're sold at Walmart and Target and Buffalo Wild Wings. So we have a national footprint. And the goal really is how do we become a famous household brand? Really? I mean, it's as, about as simple as it gets. How do we become the de facto choice? If somebody's going to have a non-alcoholic beer, it's like, I'll have an athletic, you know? And and really that's, it's a very simple uh, job to have and it's a very complex job to have. I can imagine. I mean, it, it's a simple goal. I mean, you, you, you said it in, you know, 10 words or less, but in terms of actual execution and achieving that goal, I mean, that sounds... That sounds complicated. So how do you, how do you, how do you break that down? How do you begin to think about that goal and dissect it into, you know, smaller goals or next steps or things you want to implement? Uh, I'm just trying to understand, like how how do you take a huge goal like that and then actually start to put a plan to it? So it it really begins with uh, I think understanding you know. What I, I, what I share with my team a lot is, you know, sort of situational awareness, right? So where are we now? Because where we were a year ago is so profoundly different. So what worked a year ago isn't necessarily going to work now. So what we have to recognize is, um, you know, for example, you know, the, the brand was really built sort of, as Bill will say, brick by brick, right? And that was him filling up the trunk of his car every weekend, going to different road races, sampling the beer at the end of a 5K or a 10K and getting cans in hands. And that's still true to this day. We'll still, last year we did a million samples, right? So we sampled a million cans of Athletic. Um, and how do we then take that and scale that, right? Because that's not really a scalable thing. So instead of reaching a million people, how do we reach 100 million people? How do we reach 200 million people? And so a lot of it is, you know, building awareness. So a lot of very basic blocking and tackling sort of marketing is how do I reach a broad audience with a, you know, an awareness driving message and then, you know, kind of working through the different layers, right? So I become aware, right? So now I'm aware of the brand. When I go to the store or when I go online, is he in my consideration set, right? And so making sure that we've got a really healthy mix of, you know, conventional media, digital media, social media, sampling. Um, we've got good endorsement partners. So Iron Man is a global partner of ours. So is Spartan and Ragnar. Um, we've started to branch out into venues. But how do we start to kind of, you know, from a grassroots uh, foundation, how do we kind of like work both the top and the bottom at the same time? We've got this incredible network of 1,500 ambassadors across the country, you know, that really love the brand and our, our brand evangelists. And, you know, it's a, it's a formal program where they are part of our brand, you know, and they help to share with their friends and family and, you know, followers who we are and what we do especially in today's kind of attention deficit economy where everybody's competing for a share of mind, you know, how do we capture a small portion of that? So the one second a day or a week that somebody's thinking about beer, you know, they're thinking about athletic. And then, you know, we have an unbelievable sales force as well that is out, you know, uh, in the market every single day and just, you know, trying to get the brand in front of more and more people. You know, we just opened up Florida as a state. So we're now being sold at Publix, for example. And it's incredible, you know, the traction we've gotten right out of the gate. Because again, I think the overall awareness is much higher. And then it doesn't hurt that, you know, Bill and John are sort of, you know, media darlings and we've done a great job on the PR front, just getting a lot of what we would call earned media and people discovering the brand because they read a story about, you know, on Planet Money about it's a golden age of non-alcoholic adult beverages. And we're sort of front and center in that story. So in the example of, of Florida, just, you know, 
getting getting cans into the stores there. I'm curious when that happens, do you see an increase in engagement of content or digital impressions from the state of Florida now that cans are are available there? Do you see that correlation in data? Yeah, I mean, we we certainly see it in the the numbers, you know, we see it in the sales numbers. And then also we can see, you know, searches, we can see, um, we also are a direct-to-consumer brand. So we're able to sell um, a lot of our product that's not available in store. So we create, on average, six new brews every single month. So we have what we call pilots. So these are smaller batch, limited time, uh, brewer-inspired um, products. And then we'll have limited edition products that either could be partner based or just seasonally based. So people start to discover the brand and see that we're not like a conventional brand, meaning, you know, Bud Zero, Heineken Zero, they're great competitors and they're great, you know, products, but they're loggers and they have one thing. You know, so in our case, we produced over 50 different styles of beer last year. And, you know, one of the things we do know in terms of this category is that variety is really important. I'm not always in the mood for a lager. Sure. Yeah, you got to match those winter days with a nice, dark, smooth beer. <laughs> yeah, and, I, I, and, and people have just gotten very sophisticated about what they drink, you know. And, and uh, I don't need to tell you because you probably are aware, but, you know, just the beverage category sort of writ large, there's so much, you know, there's literally a product for every need state, for every day part, like whatever I fancy, it's there, right? Part of it is, you know, is it on the shelf? Uh, but, you know, it's incredible the amount of choice, it's almost the tyranny of choice that exists out in the world right now. So I think, you know, when people can find a brand that they really trust, anything that we then put out into the market is worth my money because I know they're very high quality. I know they're very consistent. And they also, as you know, in, in terms of a company, I really subscribe to what they do and how they do it. And that, you know, also makes more, uh, that's just so much more important now than ever before. You know, people really value who they do business with. Right. And, and my money is kind of a reflection of what do I kind of value? Do you have any data or have you guys done any research on your customer purchasing decisions or their flow? I'm curious, you know, how many people discover you at the store? How many people find you online and then go find you in the store? But I'm also just trying to think of like my own habits if I'm going to the local store to buy a six pack, you know, do I do I go there to purchase something I've always I, I'm already heard of or am I going there to find something new? Um, I guess I'm curious, like what your thoughts are around the the buying journey. So, you know, it was there was a time in our history, especially like in the height of COVID, where people were really discovering us online. You know, and and we were one of the because we're non alcoholic, we can ship to 43 out of the 50 states. So we were we were attracting a lot of new users um, because we were a D to C brand. We use the power of, you know, Meta and Google, right, to kind of find new customers and then bring them into our ecosystem. And we have a, a great subscription program. But also, again, we have all these, you know, new brews that we're putting out every single month. Um, so that was, uh, you know, a big source of discovery for a lot of people. We have the good fortune to have a lot of um, you know, well-known investors in the company like J.J. Watt and David Chang and Lance Armstrong and Naomi Osaka. Um, and so, again, those, those you know, celebrity investors are also extremely helpful. They've got huge networks of followers. And, you know, it's funny because advertising is sort of the last thing that people want in their lives. They really want, you know, human connection or they want content or they want entertainment. And so you know, the job is made easier when it's coming from somebody I know and trust, right? So if, if it's good enough for J.J. Watt, who is a super high performer, you know, chances are it's, it's going to be good for me who's a weekend warrior, right? At the core of the brand is, you know, performance matters. Like if, if you're a person who needs to, wants to perform, 
like this is a great option for you. If that doesn't apply to you, then we're probably not going to be your brand of choice, you know? Um, and, and that's fine. And I think that's kind of an important thing as a marketer to know you're not for everyone, right? And you really need to know which tribes are going to subscribe to that philosophy uh, because that's where we're going to invest our dollars. Yeah, so expand on that. What are some of the tribes that you've identified who who are core athletic tribes? So, um, you know, what I would say is our aspirational target of like professional athletes. And we've got, a, you know, a big lo- uh, a list of professional athletes in a lot of sort of adventure outdoor sports. So, so that's sort of like our core. That's how the brand was built. You know, Brian Baz is of the world, um, you know, who's a kind of high performance living guy and, and an influencer, um, you know, and that's sort of like one tribe. But again, that's, that's a very small group and not everybody's going to be them. They inspire a lot of people, right? But so anyway, so like that's a group. New or young parents, right, who still very much are into socializing, want to hang out and have fun, but, you know, they've got babies at home, they've got young kids at home, they're up early, they need to be on, right? This is, this enables them to kind of, you know, hang out and be social, but also kind of wake up at 5.30 with their kids and and be like their best selves. That's also why caffeine is really important. Um, And then, um, you know, as a society, Gen Z and millennials are choosing to drink less than any cohorts that preceded them. And so there's this sort of this natural built-in alcohol avoidance that is prevalent, more prevalent in some of the younger generations. A lot of it's driven by having experienced COVID, right? And being much more aware of well-being like again the total picture so that's physical mental spiritual right and what relationship do i have with alcohol and even kind of thinking to explore it um and then you know there's lots of alternatives too like if we're being totally honest you know like you know cbd thc is you know much more available and again is an alternative to drinking right and drinking culture if you stop and if you don't examine it, right, it just, it is, it's always been like that, right? Until you kind of start to say, well, that's what my parents did, but that's not what I'm going to do. And so there, there are a lot of, um, you know, things that are happening where that younger cohort is just predisposed to, you know, be open to this as opposed to thinking this is, you know, like what, people who have an alcoholic problem are going to drink NA beer. That's not the case at all. Like they don't have any of that baggage. Yeah. So speaking of culture, how do you, how do you help people realize where non-alcoholic beer can fit into their life? Um, Cause if, if it's, you know, if it's only been made popular in the last five, six years, how do you, how do you, how do you manage that? Cause I got to assume a lot of people have a lot of stereotypes or as you said, baggage with non-alcoholic beer they have assumptions, but how do you how do you change that? How do you address that? First and foremost, the the biggest barrier is taste, and the perception is how is something going to taste really good with the absence of something, right? So it's not um, in our particular case the reason why we taste so much better than everybody else and why we're so award winning is because we have a fully fermented brewing process that removes nothing. So we make tweaks to the process itself that enables us to have this product that has never had anything removed versus most macro beers that are zero zero or you know they they burn off the ethanol right so there's there's a totally different process that we employ in brewing our beer that's you know very difficult to replicate which is why you know we we've won so many awards for our 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 products um so Taste is like the biggest barrier to overcome. And again, one of the things that I love so much is when you give somebody our product and you have them taste it and you don't even have to tell them there's no alcohol. And they're like, oh, wow, what is this? This is great. And you're like, oh, it's not, it's it's athletic brewing, there, but there's no alcohol. And they're like, what? Get out of here. That's not true. How could that be? 
Um, so that's a really, that's a fun experiment that you can do time and time again. And I go to the sampling, you know, sampling events all the time. And I love that interaction with people who are, ex you know, discovering us for the first time. It's very fun. Um, the second thing to your point is like, what is the occasion? Like, when am I doing this, you know, versus regular beer? And, and a lot of times it's, it's, you know, the biggest occasions for NA beer, watching sports on TV, right? Cause I'm, I'm at home. I want to have a beer. I don't necessarily need the alcohol. It's a Tuesday night. I'm watching a, a, a random game. Right. And then hanging out with friends. So like lower key, like we're at a backyard barbecue. Uh, we're hanging out on the roof deck of, you know, somebody's apartment building, but it's like a casual gathering where again, like I got to get up and go to work tomorrow, or I've got a training session I want to get to and be fresh for, I've got to drive carpool, you know? So it's like all these moments where beer is a perfectly acceptable choice. Alcohol is not. I've, I've never, I've never heard anyone say it like that. Cause you assume beer is alcohol. Yeah. So it's, but, but again, like, you know, when I, when I was kind of first, join the company, you know, I said at the time, and I still subscribe to it, you know, the biggest opportunity we have as athletic brewing is really educating people and not assuming that everybody knows why or when would I have a non-alcoholic beer because it's not super obvious. And we do, we do need to educate. And again, I think there's reduce, like, I think there's less and less of social stigma. And I think actually kind of the opposite now people are thinking oh like that's actually really smart i i should have thought you know <laughs> of that and it's and it's kind of getting flipped a little bit again like andrew huberman Huber, huberman labs you know did a whole story or had a whole podcast on what alcohol actually does scientifically to your body new york times this dry january published over 14 articles in one month on all different flavors of, you know, dry January, what alcohol does to your body, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So again, I think as, as, as is true with many, many other categories, the more informed and educated people are about, you know, things, the more edu like the more they're choiceful about what they put into their bodies and when and how and how often. So when you think about this, this need to educate, how do you, when you look at your, you know, your marketing toolkit or your quiver of, of tools, uh, quiver of arrows, how do you deploy those tools or how do you think about those tools? How do you use them to try to solve that goal of education? So I think one of the, the traps is, well, just look like beer and act like beer, right? Because there are certain like conventions in beer advertising in the beer category. We don't really want to like certain things. Yes. Right. The product itself, we want to make it look very appetizing. We want to show the liquid, right? That's really important because we want to look as appealing and as, you know, thirst quenching as, as the best beer in the world. But then we need to do a little bit more explaining. A lot of beer doesn't really have a lot to say, right? It's mostly there to entertain we need to do less entertaining and more educating. And, and the education is, again, around uh, this whole notion of discovery. And, and, you know, time and time again, the truth that I've seen firsthand and people relate to me all the time is, you know, I was somewhere, somebody gave this to me, and it's, a, it's been a game changer. I can't believe how good this is. And then they become evangelists and, like, they just want to talk to you when they know you're associated with the brand and they just want to like share their own experiences with you. I've never worked on a product. I've never worked for a company where people are so enthusiastic, where there's so much passion around, you know, this discovery. And how do we, again, how do you do that at scale? Like, how do you take this real kind of brand truth, human truth, and then share it? Right. And so you, again, Cole, you know, this, there's no silver bullet in marketing. It's everything. I think it's like 20 touch points in 31 days is how long it takes to convert somebody to buy something they've never bought before. So you imagine those 20 touch points, everything from, you know, a TV spot to an out of home billboard to great point of sale at retail to somebody in your social feed saying, Oh my God, I discovered athletic brewing. And then, 
five touch points later, you're like, all right, I got to go check this thing out for myself. Cause I just, I've seen it too many times not to like be curious now. Interesting. 20. I've never heard that either. 21 touch points or 20 touch points in 31 days. Is that it? I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm borrowing that from somewhere, but somebody much smarter than me, I think had done the work to figure out like, that's what it really takes to convert somebody to your brand who's, you know, not bought you before. And it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me, right? Because um, the other reality is, you know, we're a premium product on the shelf, right? So price point is much higher than conventional beer. So like, I really need to be motivated, you know, to put something incremental into my basket. And that's the other very compelling thing uh, that is athletic is an end. So like I was telling you before we started, 80% of our drinkers also drink alcohol, but they're not substituting. They're not substitutors at all. We're an incremental purchase. So they're going to pick up their six pack of their favorite, whatever, and athletic, right? So our basket size for, to a retailer, they love us because now the basket size is, you know, 10, 11, $12 higher than if they hadn't put us in it. Interesting. So, I'm curious of, of, as you said, there's no silver bullet to education and creating these touch points and building these experiences with your consumers, with your, with your audience. What tools have you tried in the past that have worked really well? Has there, has there been anything that surprised you or anything that you guys have tested that's done really well? So I, you know, PR has always been an incredible, incredibly powerful tool for us because again, it doesn't feel like advertising, right? It feels like I'm learning something. It feels like I'm discovering something. And, um, you know, there, there have been some incredible stories that we've been able to garner over the, the past years that have really helped people to find us in the first place. And again, when things come from a trusted source, I'm more inclined to believe them. If you're advertising to me, I don't believe you because I don't believe in advertising, right? Um, and and again, I think it's the network of real people that make this brand really special and unique. I think people are so passionate about finding it, wanting to share it with other people that word of mouth to me is really still our most effective tool. It's much harder to quantify and calculate, but I have no doubt in my mind that it is the single most important thing that we do as a brand. Is that hard to communicate or to quote unquote sell upstairs because there are no hard numbers or data to support word of mouth? Not necessarily. Um, we, we have a very flat organization There is no upstairs. We all sit on the same floor. So, you know, I think there's a very open, honest culture, number one. Um, And I think, again, being a founder-led company, you know, Bill and John have seen it for themselves. I think they understand the power of it. And again, if we could truly scale that, we would. But it's a very difficult thing to scale. But we do look, you know, we have tools we look at. There's a provider we use called Meltwater. So we're always looking at like our share of voice you know, in the conversation, in the social conversation, we can quantify that. We can say like, you know, we had, you know, 60% share of voice in the category when people were searching, you know, we can see search terms, we can see organic search, we can see, you know, paid search and what's working. So, I mean, there are definitely ways and as, and as a, you know, we're very much more of like a performance marketing organization we're doing both, right? We need to build the brand at the same time. We need to actively recruit new users to buy us. So it's not either or it's both. Um, and we can see it show up in the numbers because we can see our sales lift, you know, when we run media, we can see, you know, the difference of certain, um, social campaigns and how successful they are, uh, in terms of recruiting. But again, we're still, so young as a company and still like trying and learning a lot. And I think that's also for me, a a very compelling thing about how we go to market is 
we're not afraid to try things and learn and and say that worked or that didn't work and and then okay then what's next and um being very agile and iterative and again having worked with lots of software developers for a long time you know those kind of like two week sprints and the agile development you know putting that into practice versus like we're buying our media plan you know for the year in November we're not doing that because that's just not real world anymore you know we're much more opportunistic agile let's see what's working do more of that and if it's not working let's scale back and do something else well it sounds like that's that's the flexibility that a founder led company has you you can be way more adaptable way more quicker on your toes and and it's you know the other the other part of the culture is it's just not a blame thing, finger pointing culture right it's like we're going to do this we're going to acknowledge that we don't know precisely the outcome but we're willing to bet because you know there's enough there's enough either intuitive knowledge or there's enough data to support making this choice versus that choice hmm Interesting. Let's change gears a little bit. Something you mentioned in our intro call before this uh, was this idea of a transactional customer. And this is something that you're very aware of and very hyper-conscious about as as Athletic is trying to grow and, and become a household name. Can you break down what is a transactional customer and what is the, the fear uh, or what do you have to be aware of around transactional customers? So when we originally spoke, Cole, we talked about, you know, this notion of like, you can rent customers, right? But ultimately they move on. Uh, beer in particular is very much a repertoire set, sort of a category in that I may drink seven or eight different brands. That's it, that comprise my repertoire of beer. My goal is breaking into people's repertoire, right? I, I know I'm not gonna get 100% brand loyalty, but if I can get two out of 10 beer drinking occasions, that's a major win. If I can become 20% of someone's volume, right? I think that's as high as the cat, that's as big as a category as in any uh, country around the world. And, you know, good anecdote is, so we're the number one beer brand at Whole Foods, alcoholic or non-alcoholic. There's only one brand that's bigger than us, which is White Claw, but we are almost, 10% of the beer category at Whole Foods. That to me is sort of leading indicator, how big could we get? I think we could get to 10% of total beer. Remember, we're less than a share point now. So I think we could get there. And how long? Do you have any predictions on the timeline for that? Um, you know, three, four years from now. I mean, it would be incredible growth to, to be able to achieve that. But I do think... As, again, the consumer is shifting, brands, companies are going to respond. People are going to invest more in the category. Corona is launching a zero product this spring. It's going to bring a lot of new shoppers to this section of the beer aisle, right? The more money that people pour into the category, the more interesting it becomes, right? The more legitimate it becomes. So I think we stand to benefit disproportionately because of how good our product is. But again, we love that Heineken spending money in the Super Bowl. We love that Bud Zero invests. We love that, you know, this is just going to become another part of people's drinking experience. The difference is, again, and this goes back to the company you keep, right? Beyond price, what does this company stand for? Beyond experience, do I believe in their mission or not? Because, you know, Gen Z millennials care a lot about, you know, who they do business with and who they spend money with. And we just do it differently. You know, we do it differently than the competition, which is why we're trying to really create this notion of like a customer for life. Like how do we, how do we onboard somebody to the brand and then they discover a lot of the things that we do that benefit their neighborhood, their community themselves, that are just fundamentally different than I go to the store and I buy the cheapest thing I can find. And then I go back the next time and I buy the other cheapest thing I can find. And there are plenty of shoppers that are, are doing that. And I, again, I don't, 
you know, take exception to it because that's just kind of like, if this is how much money I have in my pocket, this is how much money I'm going to spend. Right. So it's a luxury to think that we can build this lifelong relationship with people. But I do believe because of the dimensions of our company, because we do only one thing, you know, we make the best non-alcoholic beer in the world. All of our competitors, for the most part, are making alcoholic products as well as non-alcoholic. So no one is maniacally focused on this the way we are and put everything that we can into this one thing and do it better than anybody else. And again, you know, a transactional company is one that really is not invested in anything beyond just, you know, just getting the transaction. I think we're much more interested in building relationships, offering something beyond the beer and the, you know, and giving something of value that transcends the price. Hmm. So as you look back on your career with all of all of the experience that you've had in the beverage industry, how do you feel like the beverage industry is changing? Um, is it changing? Is, does marketing look the same as it used to? I mean, obviously it doesn't because as you mentioned, you were at the beginning of, of Facebook and, and Instagram, but how is it changing and how do you think some of the bigger corporations are evolving and adapting to what's happening today? So it looks nothing like when I first joined, you know, um, I think, you know, kind of the beverage category again, like the kind of the big kind of all encompassing beverage category is just a much more interesting place than it used to be. Um, I think that there are so many different types of producers. I think there's so much, you know, more innovation. Um, I think the, the playing field has been leveled because you know, all I really need to kind of go to market these days is, um, you know, I just need a really good product and the internet and I'm good. That was never the, you know, when it was Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper, like, okay, good luck getting onto a store shelf because you won't, because the problem was always distribution. That problem has been solved. So I think, you know, innovation is, you know, driving even the big guys to think differently and do differently in the beer category. I still think it's much more slow to evolve. I think that there's just a lot of legacy there that the way that, you know, the laws, which are very antiquated, the route to market, you know, is very complex and, um, you know, getting to scale is really hard. There are 9,000 craft brewers in the world. In that, sorry, not in the world, in, in the U.S. alone, right? So, so again, there's lots and lots of small players, right? And, and again, you can open a brewery, you can open a, a, a tap room kind of anywhere. So the barriers are pretty low. But getting to scale is really hard. Um, and so, again, then kind of taking that and then – in, in marketing, uh, you know, how do you get, how do you grow? How do you scale? Um, and, it, and it's like I was saying before, I mean, I think the thing that doesn't change is like the human story behind all of this is still really interesting and compelling and telling that well is easier to say and much harder to do. But I think telling that human truth, like beer advertising traditionally is not very it's not really doesn't kind of deal in the truth. I think we have an opportunity to be very truthful about the experience and like what the benefits are versus, you know, others. Um, and then, you know, I just think it's uh, an opportunity for us like to be a very modern company, right? So a data driven company, a first party data company, a diverse company, you know, one of the things to me that a huge opportunity, especially in brewing, I think we do a very good job of, you know, there are a lot of women that work for athletic brewing, but, you know, from a diversity standpoint, we could definitely do better. And I think there's opportunity to do more and kind of reflect the people that we want to sell to, right, is having them be a part of our company and our culture. So I think there's big opportunities there for us. And, um, you know, the thing I love about kind of what's in front of us is there's so much more, you know, 
kind of to do an experiment with and, and, try, and, and again, I think for us, one of my favorite things to do is collaborate with other companies. And again, I think we can do that because, you know, we don't have to worry about scale per se. We don't have to worry about, you know, all the rules and regulations that a big company does. We are, it's like, you are, we like you guys, you like us, all right, let's do something. And, and it's oftentimes as simple as that. So again, just trying to maintain that entrepreneurial spirit, even as we get bigger, how do we retain that, like that spark and never let that kind of go dim because we've gotten, you know, too big. So you, earlier you are mentioning the truth, the human truth of the brand and telling those stories and, and just being true to who the brand is. Is that why you love what you do? Is that what you enjoy about marketing and working with athletic? A hundred percent you know, where sort of like life stage and career and so forth, where I am personally is, you know, I really, I care so passionately about health and wellness and well-being. Um, I don't feel like I'm compromising at all um, on my own sort of core values when I'm introducing someone to the brand. You know, I feel really good about what we do, how we do it, how good our product is. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that I'm sort of in a position to be at the forefront of that, but I know all of my teammates, you know, feel the same way. There's, you know, there's just this kind of passion for what we do that's very different and unique from so many of the other companies I've been at. And again, I've loved, you know, my experiences there, but kind of where I am and like what I care about now, and I get to live that truth every single day it's a really rewarding uh, experience and place to be and um i feel very fortunate to to get to do what i do well and i think that transparency is is very clear when you study the brand and you look at the brand i mean it's very organic it's very authentic and so it's been neat to kind of get a peek behind the scenes as to what you and the team are up to and i think that's even more encouraging just knowing how much emphasis you place on the truth trying to find those stories and 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 you know use that perspective to tell the story of the brand we've talked about a variety of different things as we as we kind of wrap up for today is there anything else that you want to mention that we didn't talk about or uh, anything else you want to leave our audience with well sort of what you just touched on cole which is the team and the team at athletic the people I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis and our partners as well. It's a remarkable group. And, um, you know, I especially am blown away by, you know, how creative our brewing team is and how, um, you know, they're, they're constantly creating uh, these new experiences and, and these new styles of beer and are really unafraid to try like kind of the impossible and like we had a, a product that we launched called Chilada Nada, which is a Michelada style beer and like working with tomato paste, like as a, as a base, apparently was super complex and they had a lot, a lot of like trial and error to get it to work, but it never dissuaded them from putting this really cool first of its kind product out into the market. And so I think that spirit of, experimentation and, and, you know, testing and learning. I love, and then like my team is just wildly creative and, and just perfectionist and they're so good at, you know, what they do. Um, and then our sales team also is just, you know, they're just relentless. And we always kind of joke like, man, I'd hate to go up against us in the market because again, I think there is just that underlying passion and then the operations team that kind of makes it all work, right? So that we can get product to market, we have the best ingredients and then, you know, we ship things flawlessly to our, you know, direct to consumer uh, users. So it's really, it's, um, it's a really cool thing to be a part of, but really it's, it is, it's the whole team kind of like knowing where we're going and how we want to get there. And then everybody just kind of having the freedom to do their thing, you know, without a lot of corporate BS or, you know, processes and things that kind of get in the way of, you know, moving fast. 
Well, it's been neat to just, you know, be a, a, a someone in the grocery store and see you guys pop up on the shelf because as you mentioned you know you guys are you guys are changing a lot of things and definitely disrupting well actually kind of creating the non-alcoholic beer category disrupting implies that there's actually like competition and and quality uh, non-alcoholic beers out there but i'm very excited to see where the company goes what the brand continues to do and i think it's neat i think you guys are giving people who you know maybe didn't feel very welcomed in the alcoholic beverage industry a place for a variety of reasons but those folks now have a place that they can be a part of and, and a brand that understands who they are and, and their unique situation and so i think that's really special and as i mentioned it's been really fascinating just to hear kind of briefly behind the scenes what's happening um and I commend you on your goal of trying to become a household name. Um, but I guess we need to check back in and what you said, three years and, and uh, famous household, famous. famous household name. So Andrew, if there's, if there's anywhere that folks want to go to learn more about athletic, I know you guys, as you mentioned, you guys have done a, a bunch of other PR stories and interviews. Is there anywhere you direct people to if they want to learn more about the brand? Yeah. I mean, we have a, a, a killer website, um, athleticbrewing.com. We also have uh, an app on the Apple App Store. So if you want to download our app, there's um, obviously you can buy our product on, on that app, but you can also, there's great um, podcasts there. There's really great content there. Um, and we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok, we're on Twitter. So you can find us um, at Athletic Brewing, you know, wherever you go for your social media. Awesome. I'll have to check out the app. I didn't know you had an app. That's unique. Yeah, it's unique. And um, we also have killer merch. Like uh, we have a sponsorship in the UK with a club called Barnsley. So I'm, I'm wearing my athletic brewing Barnsley jersey today. Ah, um, so nice. there's a lot of fun stuff. And we've got really cool collabs that we do. Um, so yeah, so it's we're more than beer. And we also have, uh, I'll make my last pitch, which is we have day pack, which is a uh, sparkling water. So seltzer infused with with hops so if you love sparkly water but like the sophisticated adult beverage taste of beer it's like something to go explore as well sold on our website soon to be at whole foods and total wine uh in 2023 awesome well i'm gonna go look for that that sounds delicious andrew thank you again for taking the time and i wish you the best and have a great day thank you cole it's been a pleasure all right take care take care